great. So let's just get a quick hello from people. I see we've got people in Germany, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, Ecuador, Mexico. Um, everyone can hear me. Iran, we have Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, Munich, Argentina. Hola, Russia, hello. Um, hello, hello. Great, so you can hear me. Fantastic, okay. Um, well, thank you very much for coming to uh, today's uh, webinar with Helbling Languages. My name is Lindsay Kleinfield. Um, I am a teacher, trainer, and writer um, at, of course books, books for teachers, blogs, all kinds of things. I'm also a podcaster. And more recently, um, I'm sort of a, a person who lives on Zoom almost all the time, doing uh, classes, observing classes, teaching, uh, and doing talks. Uh, and I suppose, like most of you, uh, are have also been teaching online. Can I just get a quick, um, quick poll here? Uh, can you type into the chat the online tool that you use if you use video classes? So are you like a Zoom user if you use video classes? Are you Teams? Are you Google Meet? Are you something else? Teams, Zoom, Teams, Meet, Zoom, 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 Meet, Vimeo, okay. Skype, Teams and Zoom, Teams, Meet. Uh, big blue button, someone said WebEx. Wow, we got some WebEx peoples here. Classroom, Meet. Zoom, Facebook groups, Teams, Skype, Zoom, Teams. Okay, good. I don't think it's uh, exceptional to imagine that all of us have had to teach in the past uh, couple of years online and um, probably using a video conferencing tool. Yeah, Google Classroom uh, or, or Zoom or whatever. Um, and so in today's session, what I'm going to be talking about is aspects of that kind of teaching. First of all, I want to give a general sort of overview about how, when we are teaching online, how the technology may be affecting our methodology. Okay, so I want to start by talking about um, technology, the intersection between technology and methodology, where they overlap and how one affects the other. Um, and then I want to talk about the whole idea of breaks or micro breaks in online work. So this, this idea of micro breaks has existed for a while now in the world of like computer programming, in the world of people working in offices and stuff. And now that a lot of us and our students have to be online a lot of the time, I thought it'd be interesting to sort of explore that with our work in ELT. So look at how we can plan and look at the importance of micro breaks, look at how we can plan um, around having micro breaks as part of the session, and then some activities which are specific to micro breaks for language teachers that I've been using. Okay, uh, Lucy, just a quick question from our panelists. Can you just reassure people if there is a recording, uh, how and when they can get it, if you can type it into the chat, just so I don't get that question coming up again, and I'll just keep going in the meantime. Okay. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do a little bit of discussion on is about education technology and methodology. And I think that in many ways, um, the technology we choose to use will affect the way we teach. Okay. And so this, um, this idea, I, I came across this idea originally when I was reading a book about the history of the blackboard. So um, the old, if we consider education technology to be anything technological, even as like as, as older as a blackboard, as an aid in teaching. Um, what the Blackboard did was that the Blackboard made um, made the idea of teaching to a large class a little bit easier. So the teacher could put something on the board and people could see at the back of the class. So it encouraged a certain kind of teaching, like teaching to a group and lecturing, okay? And so I think this is true for other things that edu certain st education technologies favor a certain teaching style. The Blackboard, for example, favored a presentation mode. If you have a big thing that you are displaying to everybody and one person is standing at the front, it favors that kind of teaching. Um, 
It also favored or led to a kind of teaching which is sometimes called lockstep. By lockstep teaching, this would usually mean that the teacher and students are doing things at the same time. If I'm teaching you lockstep and we're doing a grammar activity, that means I say, okay, everybody, now let's do the activity, everyone does it. Now let's correct, we all correct together. As opposed to activities which are not lockstep where people are working on their own things and a different classroom setup might lend itself better to other kinds of learning. But lockstep learning is the teachers and the students are doing things together. Um, also, the use of the blackboard led to a kind of teaching where there was often just one right answer. So the teacher wrote something on the board and then asks the students the questions. And then there's one right answer, like one plus one, and then asks the students and someone writes it on the board and the teacher writes the answer too. Yeah. And so for lots of teaching uh, around the blackboard led to this kind of thing uh, initially. Um, and, and also uh, a blackboard as a piece of technology leads to teacher-led teaching. Now let's fast forward from the blackboard of 100 plus years ago, 200 years ago, to um, uh, more recent of the past 20 years invention, the interactive uh, whiteboard. Now, the interactive whiteboard was supposed to be much more interactive for the learners. Yeah, so they were supposed to kind of make it much more participatory for the learners. But after a few years, many um, people looking at how interactive whiteboards were used saw that the same thing was happening. It often led to the teacher giving just nicer presentations. You had PowerPoint, you had other things like that. It led to still more lockstep. Sometimes the students would come up and, and participate on it, but it still was very lockstep and still very teacher-led. doesn't mean it was bad. It just led to that kind of a teaching. And I think also, if we look at the pandemic and um, teaching on Zoom, Google Meet, Microsoft Teams, whatever it is that we're using, that has also led to us doing more presentation, more one person talking at the same time, not everybody talking at the same time, more lockstep. Um, this is because, um, if, if you remember in the last slide, I said how certain educations certain favor a certain style. This is because um, Zoom, Teams, Google Meet, etc., were originally used or designed for sort of meetings. Um, where one person would be talking at a time, other people would be listening. Zoom was originally for business meetings. Now, during the pandemic, they've added more things and made, for example, breakout rooms better. They had breakout rooms at the beginning, but they've made them better as more and more schools started using them. But the technology itself is built for that kind of, te that kind of presenting. So my point is that when teachers use tools and technology that is better suited for a kind of delivery, it's easy to slip into only doing that kind of delivery. So as someone has wrote, written, Zoom is great for webinars and for kind of live teaching, it's easy to slip into a kind of webinar presentation mode a lot during Zoom. Not, we don't always do it, but it's easy for that to happen. Group work, pair work, collaboration can take more effort. It's possible, but it's harder. Um, it can get less focus. So sometimes it's easier for just a teacher to say, well, I'll explain and I'll ask questions and everything rather than setting up the breakout rooms or getting students to do things. Um, and I'll talk about why that is in a moment. Things like thinking time, silence, and what we would call dead time tend to be avoided even less in the online classroom. So thinking time is when you ask students a question in the live classroom and you give them a bit of time to answer. When we're online, sometimes that time feels even longer to us. Um, and so there's a tendency for us to talk more to fill the space or to expect an answer much more quickly. So the result is often, not always, but often teachers will spend more time than normal lecturing, explaining, or presenting material. And in some cases, this can be great, and in other times, it can get too much. But coming to what we're talking about today, in a video conferencing situation, if we are teaching in this way over long periods of time, it can result in what is now known as Zoom fatigue, but what has been known for a while of just getting tiredness of being in front of the computer for long periods of time. But the Zoom fatigue is, is slightly different. And during uh, 
the last year in 2021, there were several um, things that came out that had been looking at Zoom fatigue because so many people were doing so much work now on Zoom, either teachers, students, but also people in offices and so on. And so it was getting looked at a lot. And I saw this paper here from February 2021 on nonverbal overload, which is a theoretical argument for the causes of Zoom fatigue. And um, I adapted some of these findings to teaching and see if any of this you can identify with. So one of the arguments I make is that if you are seeing yourself during video lessons constantly in real time, it's it makes you tired. It's almost they they are they are, they compare it to imagine if you were teaching in front of a mirror the whole time. The effect of doing that causes like a very low level of stress and just sort of fatig and, and tired fatiguing. So imagine if you're teaching in front of a mirror all the time, how you would feel. Well, that's what we've been doing for the past two years, almost teaching in front of a mirror if you have your video on. So I have my video on and I can see myself here. Um, the other thing that's very interesting about teaching online um, for, for Zoom teaching is that it dramatically reduces our mobility. Think of when you're teaching in the face-to-face -face classroom. You maybe move around. You're at the front of the class. You move over to talk to some students. You move to different parts of the classroom. You go to the board. You come back. You sit down at your desk for a moment. You stand up again. You you turn around. You get your books ready. You, you take out the papers. You deliver things. You go over to students. In Zoom lessons, you're sitting here the whole time. So your mobility is reduced, which also causes a sort of same kind of fatigue as watching TV for a long time. Also, according to this paper, the cognitive load is higher in video chats. So people work harder to send and receive nonverbal signals. You may have noticed this in meetings or if you if you have students that are on the video as well and you want to show <clears throat> that you are listening, often people will exaggerate more. So they'll say, aha, uh -huh, oh, okay. So you're, yeah, like, okay. Or you'll, you'll make gestures more um, to compensate. Um, the other thing is when people don't, you as the teacher can interpret that as them looking very bored because you see them close up. So when you see your students like this, um, it, seeing it close up and seeing more people like that also is fatiguing. So you're, not, you're getting the wrong signals sometimes. And finally, if all the participants have their video on, having sustained eye contact from many people is stressful. Even, especially if the windows are big on the screen. So if you're seeing people's big faces, the sustained eye contact on that is quite stressful. Um, in the real face-to-face -face classroom, they've done studies of like how people's eye contact, teacher's eye contact, Sue's eye contact, you're never really making all that as much eye-to-eye -eye contact. You're looking over people's heads, you're looking up at the board and stuff like that. Whereas on the video one, you often are um, uh, doing this. Okay. Is everyone able to see my slides okay? Hold on, let me just make sure that I've got that. Yeah? Is it on presenter mode? Yes? Okay. Or are you seeing the so Yeah, you can all see my slides. You can see the slide with the break here, nonverbal theoretical argument. Yes? Okay. Good. All right, so I'm on the right thing. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's keep going. So if you so these are these four reasons were things that um, cause people to get fatigue. So what we're going to do right now is the following. We're going to take a short break. Okay, I'm going to turn my camera off for a second, and I want you to do the following. Okay, so listen and do this. First, look away from the screen and find something to look at that is maybe twenty feet away. If you've got a window, look out the window. You can stand up if you need to and focus on this thing for 20 seconds. I'm going to do the same. All right, focus on this thing 20 seconds. Okay, and we're back. Please type in the chat box what you looked at. What were you looking at? Type in English. What did you see? I'll type what I saw.
Okay, nice. Plant. I'll read some of these things. The door smiles. Um, it's too late in Bangkok. Okay. My son, a yellow block of flats, the door, trees and cars. Okay. I, I wrote in the chat as well. I wrote, um, I, I was focusing on a pink sweatshirt hanging on um, a laundry line on the roof of an apartment building in front of me. Someone was looking at an air conditioner. Okay. This was what we did. There was a 20 second micro break. Um, a lot has been written about the benefits of very short breaks. So here are some papers that I was finding when I was doing research on this. Um, lots of the breaks had been done on um, people who have to look at like things like security camera feeds and things like that. Um, micro breaks for people working in operating rooms or looking at stuff in medical cameras and things like that. Um, they would often find that these little breaks here would reduce eye stress, would reduce, um, would reduce sort of uh, fatigue in general and would in increase um, people's attention afterwards. So it would restore the attention if this was done. So for example, the Journal of Environmental Psychology had a very interesting paper in 2015, 40 second green roof view sustained attention, the role of micro breaks and attention restoration. And so a micro break is just one of, there's many kinds of ways of doing it. One way is just looking out the window at something, uh, looking away from the computer for 20 seconds. So taking a short break helps improve attention and concentration, helps reduce stress, helps alleviate discomfort and reduce the chance of injuries. I think some people were writing in the chat that they have friends or colleagues or know people or themselves who have had injuries from sitting so much and doing so much online teaching. Um, one thing from the American Optometric Association, they've even sort of got a poster for it up at, in certain workplaces, is the 2020 rule to prevent digital eye strain, where you take a 20 second break every 20 minutes, look at something 20 feet away. That's what I did with you. So I made this into a little um, language activity where um, you, for 20 seconds, uh, you looked out the window, you focused on something far away, Looked at it for 20 seconds there, then looked back, typed it into the into the chat box what you saw. So let's develop this a little bit further. And um, I'm going to share with you things that I've done with my students and other teachers have done in terms of language, in terms of mini breaks in a language class. Um, first of all, when can we do these breaks? Well, you could do them to do a reading activity. If they were doing the reading in the course book, there's a moment where you can get them to uh, do the reading where you say, okay, just look away from the computer, open your books and do the reading. Um, you can say, you can turn your camera off and get them to do the same and to do that. Um, I know, by the way, what some questions of you are going to ask at the end. So let me get to the idea of like them going away and never coming back. I'll come back to that. Um, you can uh, do a micro break to think about the answer to a question. So again, just as when we are in the face-to-face -face class, we often uh, say to, we give time, students time to think of an answer. I think we can retrain ourselves to do that more in the online classroom. So we say, everybody, I just want you to think for 20 seconds, look away from the computer and think for 20 seconds. The last time you had a cake or something like that. Let's imagine your warm up question, but then really give it like have a clock. I have this clock here, a nice, it's on my phone called huge clock app. And um, I use this to count 20 seconds. So I look, I look at that and then I look away and stuff and then I took to force me to give them that time. So that could happen as well for some questions, not all of them. Um, during a listening lesson, after the first listening, before the second listening, so if you're playing, they listen to something once, then give a 20 second break and then say, now I'm going to play it again um, to do a short writing activity, to brainstorm a solution to a puzzle or a suggestion. So these are all times when these breaks can occur or at an appointed break time. Now, I know what some of you are thinking probably because everybody asks me when I do this session, they're like, uh, my problem is that if I give students a break, they go away and they never come back. Um, and that 
could be true if you give a five minute break or the five minute break becomes a 10 minute break. What I'm talking about here is very short breaks here, like very short with a specific task. We'll look at specific tasks for them to do, okay? So I understand that a five minute break can become a 15 minute break if you're not careful. So I'm not suggesting like minutes on minutes. I'm suggesting something very short where you say, stay where you're sitting, turn off your camera, look away from the computer and Think about this, and then I want you to type the answer in the chat or say the answer if I call on you. Um, these breaks also happen in the face-to-face -face class. We're just more used to being able to deal with it. In the face-to-face -face class, often you as the teacher are moving around. So, for example, if I'm teaching a class, I might say, okay, everybody, finish exercise three. I'm going to get something written on the board, and then I'm like writing on the board or I'm rubbing off stuff on the board, and that's maybe 20 seconds. Or okay, everyone, I'm just going to get the next thing ready in the book. Everybody just talk to yourselves or write uh, a sentence, da, 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 and then I'm looking at the book. So it's just kind of incorporating that a bit more into our online class. And here's where I get into the use of the camera and audio by the teacher. Remember when we said that um, staring at yourself the whole time for a class can get tiring? I've started now taking mini breaks where I'm getting students to do things where I will turn off my camera and my audio for 20 seconds. So when I assign work to be done away from the screen, I turn off my own camera and audio. And then when I turn the camera on again and the audio on again, that's a signal that the activity comes back on again. <clears throat> so that way I'm not just staring at myself, um, you know, waiting for them to do something. Because when I do that, I use, the 20 seconds becomes like five seconds because I become uncomfortable with too much time passing and looking at myself. So I turn my camera off to, um, to, to, to mark that break and then turn it on again when I want them to come back. Um, the other thing is that when you are happy with the way you look in a frame, like in, when you see yourself, um, on some video conferencing things, you can hide your self view. So you can like, you can hide yourself uh, from it, like, or you can drag it over so that like, for example, I can drag it. I've just dragged the thing over to one side now. Um, so I don't see myself that much, but I'm, I'm looking over there. I'm looking at myself. So I'm dragging my video back over to the middle, but you can almost drag it way over so that you don't see yourself all the time. And also, I try to have moments of the class where I have audio only moments, again, to give myself a little bit of break of not looking at myself for an hour or an hour and a half nonstop. <clears throat> so these are small adjustments. So let's do the following. We're going to take a short break. Okay, so I'm going to turn my video off. I'm going to give you the instructions orally. They're on the screen, but I want you to do this as well. Do this at the same time. Ready? Okay, stand up. No, my video is off, Muhammad. Stretch your arms. Okay. Roll your head and shoulders. Now, walk to the nearest door and count the steps. Ready, go. Okay, come back to the screen. I'm coming back on again. So, actually, I already feel a little bit better just from having done that. Um, so this here is the mini stretch break. Um, you can't do it for them, but I, I often turn the video off and I, I give the instructions. But the extra thing we added is counting the steps. Uh, so giving a specific task. Can people write how many steps they took to get to the door? I'll write how many steps I took. I would six, six, seven, six, ten, three, five, ten, six, seven, four, five, four, two. Somebody's like very close to a door. Fifteen. Um, there are maybe a hundred of you here, so I can't do feedback properly on this. But with a class, I maybe have only like twenty people or fifteen people, um, where I can sort of ask more questions, like who is the closest to a door, who is in the biggest room, who is in the who's in the smallest room. You could do a little activity like that. So. Um, just something like that is to kind of like reactivate people's attention. And as, as you could see, that took us less than a minute. Yeah. So it's a very short little thing to do. Um, 
other stretches i got i got you to roll your shoulders and roll your head other stretches that i found for people um working on computer or desk stretches is the back extension so repeating that uh three times obviously i'm not a doctor so i tell people to be careful if if they if they don't have the mobility they shouldn't do it um neck forward doing that one do once for 15 seconds neck left neck to right elbow pullover etc so some if I, especially if i'm teaching um younger learners or i'm doing body vocabulary i maybe do one of these activities where it's like let's do a little bit of stretching in front of the, if we've been here for an hour or you know if i have a very long class i might say okay let's just do a little bit i'm and i always make it like an english activity so i say i'm going to give you some instructions for stretches in english so you have to listen and do what we say, and this will be our little break, and then we do the stretches together. And so they kind of get it as stretching and a micro break and a bit of English practice. So that's another option. Um, I said that one of the ones, the micro pause activity we did there was with movement. You stood up, you went and counted the steps of the door. Here are some other ones that other teachers have done using movement as the micro break. So get up and I'm not, don't do these. I'm just gonna talk about these, okay? Walk to the nearest door, count the steps. So that's one. Get up and blink your eyes five to 10 times rapidly. Okay, that's another one. Get up and do a lap walking around your house. These are just moving ones. I'll talk about how we incorporate language into them. Get up and do three to five simple stretches. Um, yes, Laura, the webinar will be available later. Uh, we'll tell you that at the end how that happens. Um, now, those last ones that I just that I just went over, walk to the nearest door, blink your eyes. These are only movement. But we're language teachers, so let's mix these also with language. How you could make a little language activity with these. Get up, walk around the house, and find three things that are green. Okay, that would be one, for example. Um, get up go to a bookshelf take a book and bring it back to show to us and so then i get students to turn on the video everyone has to show a book we talk about the different uh the maybe just very brief little things so finding a book show it to us go to the fridge and get some water make a mental note of five english words for things you see there okay that would be another one walk around naming things you can see in english name at least 20 things Okay, open a window or door to the outside, listen for 30 seconds, what do you hear? Get an item of clothing, souvenir, object to tell us about. And if I do this, I tell the students, I say, not everyone's gonna do this, I will pick one person randomly. So everyone has to get something, but I pick one or two people randomly to turn your camera on, show us what you did, yeah, what you got, an object, an item of clothing, a souvenir, etc. Okay. So these are, these are the sample kinds of things you can do. I might ask you for different um, ideas yourselves in a moment, okay? So you can kind of combine these two. So they get up, do a stretch, and then find things in the house that are green, or find some things in the fridge. Or um, another one teacher that I knew in Turkey actually did, uh, did the thing with um, younger learners where they were doing food lessons. They had to go to the fridge and count like the number of eggs or how much milk or who uh, they had like a scavenger hunt, a list of things that they had to tick off on the list. Yeah, but again, it was getting out of your chair, getting away from the computer, going and doing something else, coming back. It doesn't have to take a long time. Okay, let's look at a longer activity, a micro pause activity that's longer. Okay, let's do this one together. So, I'll do this one with you. I'll explain it first and then we'll do it, okay? So first you post a preposition on a shared screen or you just say it or write in the chat like in or on or whatever. Then students get up and find an object from their home to illustrate the preposition. The flowers are in the vase, the cat is on my lap. When they come back, you call on them to share their sentences. If, they, if possible, they turn on their webcam to show it. So let's do this now. I'm gonna turn off my camera. We're each gonna do this. I want you to, and then I'll 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 ask you to type in the chat box. But the preposition is behind. 
The preposition is behind. So you need to get out of your chair, look around for 20 seconds and find something that you can make a sentence with the preposition behind, okay? 20 seconds, go. Okay, should be back. Let's see. We've got hair. Let's see what we've got. The, uh, my fridge is behind me. My cat is sleeping behind me. There's a stack of books behind me. I'm behind the tree. The dustbin is behind the door. My son's toys are behind the cushions. Um, let's see what else do we have. There's a big dining table behind me. The water bottles are stored behind the chair. The sugar is behind the piggy bank. The bag is behind. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. My sentence was the cat is behind the door because in my... In my room, there's a door there and the cat is waiting there for me to feed her after this. Okay. Um, if you have a smaller group, I, again, how many of us are there in here? There are 245 of you. So I'm not going to, I can't get everyone to turn their videos on. I can't read everybody's sentences. With a smaller group though, you could, you could do that. Or what I did, if you do a longer activity, then you have one person who nominates the next preposition. So you correct the sentences, the prepositions, and then you say to someone, okay, for example, Lucy, now don't do it, Lucy, but you would say, Lucy, you give the next preposition. And she gives a preposition like above or under or in. And then people have to get up and find something or whatever. Yeah. So they just do that. Um, potentially if you're if they're on computers they could even take a photo of something and then you could get them to show the photo of the thing illustrating the preposition it's a small thing but it's just another way the important thing is to um make sure that they get up take a tiny break and do that yeah so the next time you have a micro pause another student gives the preposition and you repeat the activity yeah next time you have another micro pause you say, let's do a preposition micropause, everybody, da, da, da. Again, that's how you repeat it. Yeah. Other variations of this. You can do this with prepositions of movement, across, over. Students report an action they did during the micropause. E.g., I walked across the room. I jumped over the dog. I stepped over whatever. I, I walked through. I put my hand through uh, the, the whatever. I put my hand into the fridge, etc. Yeah. So. This is just, in a way, the, the important thing is a micropause. The other thing is putting some language in it to, to give them something to do. Okay. We can also um, do, with micropauses, we can do slightly longer, even longer activities. So, so that was a little bit longer. Here's um, uh, an activity that my colleague Jill Hadfield has written about called Zooming Out. Um, and Zooming Out... Uh, she calls it this, she has a series of activities that I've also worked on with her called zooming out activities where you're doing this kind of thing is getting students to go away from the camera for a moment and do something and then come back. Okay. And so zooming out, um, she suggests a sensory poem. So I'll show you what this could look like. So here she says five to 10 minutes. I would say less time. I would say maximum five minutes. But again, this is a longer pause for your long classes. It, it's also a writing activity. So students go outside for five minutes, maybe a bit longer. She says five to 10, but uh, to sit in silence and ask about these and uh, think about the questions. What can you see? What can you hear? What can you smell? What can you feel? And then they come back and they talk about or they write what they experienced. Then you share on, on the PowerPoint, on your shared screen, you give them this framework. Spring, summer, autumn, winter, morning or afternoon, yeah? So, and then they would write like the hearing line. They would have the noun ing. So for example, um, Let's, let's just do this for a second. Let's do this one at a time, okay? So I'm gonna stop the video for, for 10 seconds. I want you to look away from the camera and focus on what you can hear out a window, okay? Don't leave, just 10 seconds. What can you hear, all right?
Okay, I'll give the first example and now other people write their example. I'm going to write, okay, so don't write, I'm listening to, yes, more like what Eakin did, cats meowing. I would put motorbike revving, um, children playing. Yeah, so you write it like that, the noun, a car passing. Uh, Shirvan, it would be the rain falling probably, wind howling. Uh, city noise, for then it has to be a verb, like city noise blaring, neighbors talking, car driving, birds singing, etc. right? Okay, and now let's do it again, the next one, okay? You, I want you to look out the window and th look at what's thinking in the sentence is noun ing, something that you can see. Yep, ready, 10 seconds. So something you could see, I would type clouds moving because I can see clouds moving, clouds floating, very nice. Tree branches moving, sun setting. Oh, nice, Stephen. Uh, something, but Luis, it, you put my garden. It would be something in your garden. Clo Laura put clothes hanging, a vendor selling. Excellent, Maria. Tree top swaying. That's beautiful, Elizabeth. Tree branches moving, leaves falling. Although Naomi, it would just be leaves falling for this poem, yeah? Um, and I would say, Eakin, you put street lights, I put like street lights shining, yeah? So anyway, so then the next one, let's do the next one together as well. Okay, I'll give you a second, 10 seconds. Um, and you have to smell, and then you write the scent of and whatever you smell, okay? Okay, so it would be here, for example, even about the scent of the city, the scent of cologne, the scent of the dictionary pages, the scent of coffee, the scent of polluted weather, the scent of flowers, the scent of a candle. Oh, that's nice, Annette. The scent of my neighbor's cooking, the scent of chicken cooking. Okay, you've got the idea. And the last thing then is they would, you have to make a sentence, noun, preposition, noun. For example, my hand on the mouse, meaning the keyboard, like the, the, the computer mouse. Yeah. So I'm going to think of, uh, think of something where it's like, or like noun, preposition, noun, whatever, the, the wind in the trees, my hand on the mouse, uh, the cat under the window. Okay. Think of that 10 seconds. I love Stephen's one, my head on the pillow. So like you're lying there watching the video like this then, okay? <laughs> the flowers in the pot, my eyes on the cycle, my dog on the floor, the wind among my hair, my heart in the highlands. Oh, very nice, Sadat. Um, books on the desk, etc. Okay, so here are some poems that her B2 students came up with. You put these all together and you make a poem. For example, these were her B2 high level students. Summer afternoon, birds chirping, butterflies fluttering, the scent of flowers, the sun on my face. Autumn morning, wind blowing, leaves falling, the scent of bonfire smoke, a chill in the air. So here, it, so the, again, let me just go over that again. They would do this as one break, they'd have to do this first part. Or you could do it the way I did it very quickly, where you give them like, they do each part at a time, right? And they make it bit by bit. Or they they um, they make notes for part one, you talk about it, but part two, they give the framework for part three, and they write their poem. Yes, they are a little bit like haikus. Yes, Graciela. I don't know if they're exactly the haiku, um, but it's 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 very similar. Okay, so these are some poems. Let's um, talk a little bit about, for the last <clears throat> around seven to ten minutes here, we're going to talk about planning and micropauses, okay? Um, so what 
I wonder if this is true for you. I know it's true for me. Um, covering the same amount of materials online is more challenging than face-to-face. -face. So for example, if I've got a book like this book here, which I wrote and I teach from sometimes. So this book here, I usually can do all of this, for example, in an hour and a half. It's sometimes harder for me to do it all in the same amount of time. Like it's, it's I, I can't, I, I often don't, or, or, I, or I have to do things really quickly or whatever. So um, if that's the case, incorporating micro breaks, you sort of like, well, this might just take up more valuable time. Um, but I think counterintuitively it might not because sometimes the little micro break, if it refocuses people's attention, things go quicker um, afterwards, yeah? Um, so when I'm planning a lesson, I try to assign some of the work before the lesson to reduce the burden. I know they don't always do that, but I try to get them to read sometimes something before. I try to get them to, to, to do a, a little bit of the book, something else before the lesson. Yeah, either in a WhatsApp group, if I have a WhatsApp group with them, I do that before <clears throat> trying to do some of that. Um, but I also look at ways that micro pauses can be a natural part of the lesson without like th that last activity, the poem activity is long. So that's different. But those other little ones can be part of a natural, um, a, a natural flow of the lesson. Yeah. Um, so reading something, preparing something quietly, incorporating micro breaks into that. Uh, especially if they don't do the work beforehand, which I know, Rebecca, that I, I have a 50-50 chance that they do it or not beforehand. Doing a micro break a bit earlier in the class means that you're less likely to skip it. So if you if you leave the micro break for later, then often it's like doing the speaking activity at the very, very end where it's like you run out of time. It's like, oh, I forgot. I'm supposed to give you a little tiny break. Okay, let's do it now doesn't work so well. So often I'll do it like after the first little bit, just like I did in this session, the first micro break to kind of get, get them used to it. Um, look at some of the activities for a class and think about how they could be done off screen. Okay. And that's what I want us to do for the next like, sort of three or four minutes. Uh, see how they could do that um, off screen. If you get practice in, yes, I think Edison that playing a song can count as a micro pause. If you get them to look away from the screen while they're listening. So you say, turn off your cameras, just listen, close your eyes or look out the window and listen to the song that could also count as a micro pause. Yeah. Um, let's look at an example here. I'm going to give you just a couple of minutes. Here's an example from a course book. It is one that I've written. It's called Studio. Um, this isn't a presentation about Studio, so I'm not going to explain it, but I, you all know course books. So I, I imagine you can look at a lesson and more or less see what's going on. We have some, we have some listening here. Uh, let me just show you. So we have listening here. We have vocabulary of feelings. We have some grammar and we have some speaking. Yeah. So what I'd like you to do is look at this and think about where, if you were teaching this lesson, where you might put micro pauses. Okay. I'm going to give us a minute and a half to do this. I'm going to uh, stop my video for a minute and a half. Um, Sandra, I'll come back to that question about pause time for a three hour lesson, but I would have more than one pause for a three hour lesson. Imagine if you're I taught that in Germany, three lessons. Games as micro pauses, I would not um, would not uh, count that as a micro pause. Um, someone asked in larger slide, I made this as big as I can, I'm afraid. So um, not much else I can do. I can't enlarge this more. Um, yeah, I'm trying to see if there's any other. No, I can't really do it. I'll be showing you on another slide the different parts, okay? But see, um, yeah. The print is too small to read. Well, after the, I don't expect you to read all the different sentences. It could be on your computer as well. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give you a moment to take a look at it. If you're not able to see it, just think of a lesson when you would put in micro pauses. Okay. One minute. Uh, think about this. Uh, take a look if you can. And if you can't think about it in a lesson of your own. Back in a minute.
and I'm back again. Okay, people are all sharing different ideas. So some people are saying after the reading, the listening or the vocabulary, yeah. Um, before the grammar, after the first page, agree. Um, after a listening task, before the vocabulary, think of a word you didn't know, okay, yeah. I think all of these are valid. Any of these are valid. It's more, the exercise here isn't like where it's right or wrong. It's where it's right for you and thinking with the idea of incorporating little pauses in different ones. Let me show you how I did this lesson. Um, is the thinking time before speaking is I did this. So uh, this, the, this um, like many uh, books, it's available PDF, like there's, uh, or like the, there's an ebook version of this. So I have the ebook version and I took a screenshot of this image first and I made this image big. And so my first, the way I started the class is I showed this image and I told everyone to look at this image for 20 seconds. And then I pressed W on my screen, on my PowerPoint. So if you press W, the screen goes white. Yeah. Or if you press B, no, it's W, it's W. For me, it's W. If you press W, the screen goes white. Or you can just get rid of the slide, yeah? And then I said, um, now walk around and try to remember all the things you said. So the first micro pause to begin the class was, here's an image. I want you, everyone to look at the image for like 30 seconds, 40 seconds. And now get up, walk around, try to remember five things that you saw in that image. 20 seconds and then everyone did that and then they come back and they write in the chat box what things they saw. Oops, sorry. Yeah, so like a, a memory activity. So maybe people come back and they type Stranger Things or Amy Winehouse or uh, Man with Lightning. That was David Bowie. Yeah, and then that leads nicely to the first speaking activity, which is about um, they had to match the people and things with the years that they were in the news, if they can remember. Like we, we look at it, so when was Stranger Things? When was Amy Winehouse, Harry Potter, etc. Yeah, they may be able to get some of these things. And then they do the reading. So that's my first one. And my first micro break I put here, where it says, listen again and choose the correct options. So they did a listening. And then I said, okay, um, before you do the next listening, I want you to just get up, stretch, focus on something else because you're going to listen again in 20 seconds. Um, and so they, that was my first micro break after the beginning thing. Um, here, the vocabulary, and again, each of you can do as you see fit. As a teacher, you we each have these choices, not right or wrong. But what I did here is in the vocabulary under feelings, they had to match adjectives to the words like amazed is very surprised and depressed is very unhappy or whatever, right? Um, they had, we did all of that together. And then the last is they had to write example sentences. And I said, this you have to go and do in a different part, like do it on paper. I said, you need to do it on a piece of paper because you need to show me the piece of paper, but I want you to do it away from the screen. So go like turn the tablet away, the phone, the computer, go to another thing and write the sentences on a piece of paper and then show me. So that was that was another micro break. And then the third one that I did was for the speaking. Um, the speaking, this is this is a a lesson on the year in search. And the speaking activity, um, they had to imagine that they were searching for things that happened in the world this year. So the first part of the speaking was individually think about the past 12 months. What happened in the world? Okay, well that's a bit well, we all know some things that happened. Did anything make you feel amazed, confused, delighted, depressed, or scared? Well, I know what all made us feel depressed, but we could focus on the other ones if you want more positive things. They need to choose three events and imagine they want to search the internet for information about the events, write the keywords they want to search for. So they're doing a kind of keyword search preparation thing here. Um, and then they share those with the partner. But that whole first part, I would do them by themselves. Like I would explain to them and I would say, now you need to take two minutes to kind of think of this and make that list and do that as a pause away from the computer. So let's review before I take some questions for the last sort of five minutes of the thing, let's review a little bit what we looked at. Um, 
Today, I wanted to start off by doing a bit of the theory and talking about um, how certain technologies affect methodology. Does anyone remember what the first education technology thing I was illustrating on the first slide? We talked about, I talked about, a certain, the, the thing that changed the way people taught. What was it? The blackboard. Yes, it was a blackboard. So uh, looking at how the blackboard changed teaching um, made for like, a, made it easier to be teaching to a large group of people, sharing, displaying information, lecturing, and so on. And then we looked at how the interactive whiteboard also did the same thing and how Zoom and those things also kind of make it for more like one person presenting for a long time, yeah? Then we looked at the importance of breaks in online work. One of our first activities, let's see if you remember, the first activity was I asked you to take a break and look at something at a certain distance for a certain amount of time. It was the same number each time. What was it? It was the something, yes, 20, 20, 20. And the, so that was take a break every 20 minutes for 20 seconds, look at something 20 feet away or 20 meters away if you wanna look something further away. By the way, the argument for that from the, um, the Eye Doctor Association was that by doing that, you relax your eyeballs because looking at the computer close like this the whole time is what's giving you strain on your eyeballs. So by focusing on something far away, you're relaxing your eyeballs from that strain. So we then looked at breaks in online work, ways of like getting up, um, going to the door, counting the steps, going to the fridge, looking for things in the house. Uh, and we looked at like movement breaks, stretching, um, walking around, things like that. And then ma matching that with uh, language breaks. Yeah. So stretching and talking, naming parts of the body, um, getting up and walking and saying the names of things in English and so on. Finally, we looked at longer micropose activities like the prepositions one. We also looked at uh, a poem activity, which meant getting away from the screen. And then we looked at planning, like taking a lesson and seeing where you could do the plan as well as all those activities. Sorry, I got that in the wrong order. Different activities for micro pauses. Um, that brings me to the end. For the last five five minutes, um, if anyone has a question, Lucy, had people been putting questions in the question things, or shall I take questions now? Um, and then I'll just show, uh, Lucy will come back for the last slide to talk about where you can get the recording and everything like that. I have a question here that I can see. I'm going to go for, first of all, Rebecca's question, then Fidan is Barova. So Rebecca asks, can someone repeat what is 2020? 2020, Rebecca, is every 20 minutes, if you're working on a screen, take a break for 20 seconds and look at something 20 feet away. So it's like to relax your eyes. So every 20 minutes, take a break for 20 seconds, look at something that's 20 feet away, like focus on that and just allow your eyes to relax. Um, Fidan asks, how right is it to make students to force them to keep their, <laughs> I knew this is gonna happen, always, do we force them to keep the cameras on? Um, I don't, because often I'm teaching in country, teaching countries where their internet isn't good enough if we all have the cameras on at the same time. I know some teachers who have to because the school says they have to check in because otherwise the students doing PlayStation or doing something else. So I, I try to check in with them. So I'm like, can people turn on their cameras now for a bit and then do that? If I have a small group and they do have their cameras on all the time, I sometimes ask them to turn their camera off to do an activity. Yeah. Um, making sure, but Fidan also says, making sure they are actively participating cameras off seems almost impossible. Well, yes and no. It does because you're not able to always see, right? And I don't know if all of you did those activities. I don't know if you got up. I have to assume on good faith that you did, um, but I think many of you did. I think many of you did stand up when I asked you to, not everybody, but many of you did. Um, I think in the same way of like, there's only so much we can do and there's so much they can do. I think one of the things that technology has led to is a way of wanting to be surveillancing, like doing surveillance on our students all the time. So it's like, how can I be sure? I need to have their cameras on so I can see exactly what they're doing, where their eyes are all the time. And I think that's unfortunate because in the face-to-face -face classroom, if you're teaching a group of 30 students, you cannot control what everyone's doing at every second of the time. And we've gotten used to that. I think we have to get used to it in the online classroom as well. I know it's not 
what people want to hear, but I don't want to teach in an environment where, for example, students have to have cameras like trained on them all the time to like make sure that they're, you know, that that leads to me into kind of like a dystopian way of looking at controlling work and school. Um, that being said, I like to check in with students just like I do in the face to face class. I will always check with students like, so Zoltan, what do you think? Oh, Maria, what do you say? So I'm making, I, they never know when I'm going to call on them, but that's different from saying I've got eyes on them all the time. Okay, lots of other questions here. There are several that have come through. Um, thank you, by the way, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. The slides will be shared. Lucy will tell you that in a second. Um, are there any courses designed for the video uh, conference room? Not that I know of, although you can teach with studio. My course, you can teach it completely with screen sharing. It has an on uh, a, a digital version. Uh, feeling pain in the eyes, Luis talks about after Zoom classes, a common complaint among students. Give them more of the breaks. Look away from the room. Rub your eyes. Uh, don't always focus on the screen so hard. Luis, I'd also say if they're complaining about that, then they are focusing on the lesson. So that's a good thing in a way. Um, there'll be another 68 ones. I won't be able to get to all of these. Um, Gabrielle, thank you. Thank you for your message. Um, Lucy, we're coming to an end. Um, do you want to come back? I'll go to the last slide here. But really, all that remains for me to do is to say a huge thank you, Lindsay, to for you, for your time, for your input, and to thank all you, everyone. everybody joining us today. Thanks very much. We look forward to seeing you all soon at the next Helbling English webinar. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.